As all of you know, life can be a struggle sometimes. Making ends meet isn't always as easy as just getting a job. Several years back, I couldn't find work. It was rejection after rejection, and at the time, nobody was really hiring. The few places that were hiring were very competitive. I was barely making over minimum wage as a deli employee at a grocery store. I remember one night I was online looking for ways to make extra money and stumbled upon Craigslist. I had heard of Craigslist but never really explored it myself. I found an ad for a freelance job as a secret shopper. For those who may not be familiar, a secret shopper is an anonymous customer who visits a store and asks the employees a series of questions. The employee is then graded on certain criteria, such as making eye contact, greeting the customer, offering suggestions, and giving a parting comment. It seems simple, but companies take this seriously. At the store I worked for, employees could be reprimanded or even fired for receiving multiple bad secret shopper scores. Since I had experience working in retail, I thought this would be an easy way to make some money on the side. The first store I visited was part of a local grocery chain in my hometown. Oddly enough, it was the same company I worked for, though not the same store. I started making my rounds and noticed a man probably in his 20s, stocking shelves. He glanced at me but quickly looked away without greeting me. I had to greet him and ask where the canned tuna was. Without lifting his head, he grumbled, aisle two, halfway down this guy was losing points for not making eye contact and for not offering to show me where the item was. I know this may sound ridiculous, but companies take these evaluations very seriously. If an employee receives a bad score, they could lose their job. I was trying to give the guy a chance to redeem himself by saying goodbye as I left, but he never did. When I finally made a parting remark, he looked up and muttered, Yeah, you too. I glanced at his name tag Patrick and walked away, noticing that he seemed to keep an eye on me. It was almost as if he had figured out I was a secret shopper. Every time I looked up, Patrick was at the end of the aisle, making me uncomfortable. I decided to finish my shopping quickly and head out. At the register, the cashier performed well, passing her secret shop with flying colors. After checking out, I rushed to my car, eager to leave. While sitting in my car, I began writing my report, wanting to get all the details down while they were still fresh. As I wrote, I glanced up and saw Patrick walking briskly through the parking lot. I ducked down, hoping he wouldn't notice me. Fortunately, he didn't, and after getting into his car, a dark sedan, he sped off. I waited a few minutes before leaving, feeling relieved but uneasy. Something about Patrick just seemed off, but I chalked it up to overthinking. That night, I emailed my supervisor the report and tried to forget about the interaction. A few nights later, I was having dinner with my boyfriend when we were interrupted by loud, aggressive banging on the front door. It wasn't a typical knock, it sounded like someone throwing their entire body weight against the door. We looked out the window, and I was shocked to see Patrick, the guy from the grocery store. He looked terrible, with sunken eyes and a disheveled appearance, like he hadn't slept in days. I yelled for him to leave, warning that I was calling the police. But he didn't flinch. He kept banging on the door, demanding that I let him in, saying I had ruined his life and that I needed to pay. He kept repeating, there will be an eye for an eye, I had no idea what he meant, and my boyfriend quickly called the police. Thankfully, they were in the area and arrived within minutes. Patrick was tackled on the front steps and during his arrest, the officers found a knife concealed in his waistband. The thought of what he might have done with that knife still haunts me. After the arrest, I learned that Patrick had been going through a tough time. He had been struggling to pay his bills, and his girlfriend had just broken up with him the day I visited the store. 
My secret shopper report had led to his termination, and that was the final straw for him. I still don't know how he found out where I lived, but I stayed at my boyfriend's place for a while after that. I rarely stayed at my old house alone. I hope Patrick got the help he needed, but I also hope these stores reconsider their secret shopper programs because they can push people over the edge. I used to go to the park almost every day after school. It was a small, quiet park with a few benches, some swings, and a patch of woods at the far end. On most days, the park was empty, but sometimes a few people would walk their dogs or jog through. It felt peaceful, and I liked being there alone with my thoughts. One day, as I was sitting on a bench near the swings, I noticed a boy who looked about seven or eight years old standing by the edge of the woods. He was just standing there, staring at me. At first, I didn't think much of it, assuming he was probably with his parents nearby. But after a while, I realized something was off he wasn't moving, and there was no one else around. I tried to ignore him, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The boy's gaze was fixed on me, unblinking, like he was studying me. He didn't smile, didn't fidget, he just stood there, completely still. I glanced around, hoping to spot someone who might be looking for him, but the park was as empty as ever. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I decided to get up and leave. As I walked away, I looked back at the boy. He was still standing in the same spot, watching me. I quickened my pace and didn't stop until I was out of the park and halfway down the street. For the rest of the evening, I couldn't shake the image of that kid standing there, staring. The next day, curiosity got the better of me and I returned to the park. I didn't really expect to see the boy again, but there he was, standing in the same place by the woods, staring at me just like before. This time I felt a chill run down my spine. Something about him seemed unnatural, his clothes looked out of place, old-fashioned even, and his face was pale, almost ghostly. I tried to avoid eye contact, and sat on a different bench, farther away from him. But no matter where I sat, I could feel his eyes on me. It was like he was watching my every move. I stayed for only a few minutes before I couldn't take it anymore and left. Over the next few days, I kept seeing the boy at the park, always in the same spot, always staring. No one else seemed to notice him, and I never saw him with anyone. He was just there like a fixture in the park. I started going to the park less often, and eventually I stopped going altogether. The unease he caused me was too overwhelming. Months passed, and I had almost forgotten about the creepy kid. But one night, while scrolling through social media, I came across an old photograph of the park from the 1960s. In the background of the picture, standing by the edge of the woods, was a boy who looked exactly like the one I had seen. That's when I realized the boy wasn't alive. He never was. Last year I was trying to sell my 2007 Mercury Mariner. It was in pretty good shape but had a lot of miles and was kind of old. Overall, it ran very well and was a good car. I decided to list it on Craigslist because I had experience buying cars there before. My previous experiences with Craigslist had gone pretty well. I took several pictures of the car and then listed it. The next day I didn't get any interest at all, but on the second day I received a response to the AD. The text message came from a man named Al who said he wanted to buy the car. He seemed pretty confident about it right away. I was asking a reasonable price, so I gave him my address to come and look at it. I lived in an apartment building, and I didn't think it was a big deal to give out the address because there were several buildings in the complex. My car was already parked out in the parking lot, 
so the guy would have no way of knowing which apartment was mine. I asked Al when he was free, and he said he could come by the next day after work at 9 p.m. I agreed, cleaned out the car, and got it ready for selling. The following night, I left my apartment building and went to my car in the parking lot. Al showed up shortly after and parked nearby. He got out, and I met him by my mariner. He was a big guy, had lots of tattoos, and was probably about 250 LBS and 6 FT tall. After meeting him, I showed Al the car, and he looked around at it. After several minutes, he asked to take it for a test drive. I went with him. Al drove the car around the block and down some nearby streets. He said he liked it and that it seemed fine. At that point, I really thought I was going to sell the car that night. After the test drive, we returned to my apartment complex. He parked the car in the space where it had been before, but then, after we got out of the car, Al said he would think about it. I was disappointed because it seemed like he was going to buy it before, but I just said okay and said goodbye. That's when Al asked if he could use my bathroom. This seemed sketchy. Why did he think it would be okay for him to use my bathroom? I said no thanks and started walking away. I was afraid it might be some sort of setup and I didn't want this guy coming into my apartment. He was still standing around by my car though. My apartment building had a side door and a front door. The side door was not very far away, so I decided to walk to the front. I left Al standing there and headed inside. I was afraid he might follow me, but when I got to the front doors, I looked back and didn't see him at all. This made me feel better, and I entered the building. When I got inside, I turned to the right and entered the elevator. I took it up to the third floor, which is where my apartment was. When I arrived, I stepped off and started walking to the left, but I saw the door at the end of the hallway open. It led to a stairwell, and I saw Al entering the hallway. At first, I started going towards my door, but then I saw Al coming towards me. I quickly stopped, turned, and started walking in the opposite direction. At that point, I started to hear Al begin to run in my direction, so I started sprinting to the end of the hallway. When I made it there, I went into the stairs on the other side and ran down. As I was going down the stairs, I heard Al enter the stairwell and continue to chase me. I then went into the underground parking garage beneath the building. When I got down there, I ran across to the other end of the building. I had extended my lead on Al a little bit. I heard him get to the parking garage and keep chasing me. Then I got to the stairs on the other side, ran up them to the ground level, and left through the side door. After I was out of the building, I ran to my car, got inside, and drove away. I called the police while driving off and told them about the man. I drove around the streets nearby for a few minutes and then returned. When I did, Al's car was still there, but he was not inside of it. The police arrived just a couple of minutes later. I didn't go back inside the building until they did, and when they arrived, they actually found Al attempting to break into another apartment. It turned out he was never interested in buying my car. I guess he was just planning to rob me or something. Last summer, I decided to go hiking in a remote area of the National Park. I had been there before, and I knew it was beautiful, but it was also quite isolated. The trail I wanted to hike was known for its stunning views and solitude, which was exactly why I wanted to go there. I set out early in the morning, carrying a backpack with all the essentials water, snacks, a first aid kit, and a map. The hike was supposed to take about four hours, so I was prepared for a long day. The weather was perfect clear skies and mild temperatures. I felt confident and excited as I started the hike. The trail was well marked at first, but as I ventured further in, the markings became less frequent. 
the path began to wind more and the forest grew denser. I was enjoying the challenge and the peace of being surrounded by nature. However, as the hours went by, I realized that I hadn't seen any other hikers and the trail seemed to be getting more confusing. At one point, I noticed that the sun was starting to dip below the horizon. I had been so focused on the hike that I hadn't paid much attention to the time. I decided it was best to turn back before it got dark, so I retraced my steps as best as I could. But with the fading light, everything started to look the same and I quickly lost my way. Panic set in as I realized I was disoriented. I tried using my map and compass, but nothing seemed to match up with what I was seeing. I wandered around for what felt like hours, my flashlight barely making a dent in the darkness. My phone had no signal, so I couldn't call for help. I was beginning to fear that I might have to spend the night out there. Just when I thought I was completely lost, I heard a distant sound of faint, rhythmic thudding. I followed the sound, hoping it was someone else in the area. As I got closer, the sound became clearer, and I saw a small light in the distance. My heart raced with hope as I approached. To my immense relief, I found a group of hikers setting up camp. They were as surprised to see me as I was to find them. I explained my situation, and they kindly offered to help. They guided me back to the main trail and made sure I was safely on my way before continuing with their own plans. I made it back to the trailhead just as the last light of day disappeared. I was exhausted but incredibly grateful to have been rescued. The experience taught me to always be more cautious and prepared no matter how familiar the trail might seem. I am a man in my thirties hailing from a small town, and I have a chilling tale to share about my encounter with the unpredictable world of Craigslist. It all started when I decided to sell my US television set on the website. The TV was nothing extraordinary, just a modest entertainment center but I thought it might catch someone's interest. Little did I know that the simple act would spiral into a horrifying ordeal that still sends shivers down my spine. The first sign of life from the other side of the screen was a message from a woman who seemed quite keen on the entertainment center. Hi there. I saw your TV listing. Is it still available? She messaged. We exchanged a few messages and soon enough, we had arranged a time for her to come over and inspect the item. The plan seemed straightforward enough. We agreed on 7 o'clock and I made sure everything was ready for her visit. As the clock neared 7, I waited with anticipation. But as the minutes ticked by, there was no sign of her. Confused, I decided to text her to see if she was still planning to come. After what felt like an eternity, I finally received a response just when I was about to call it a night. So sorry. Can I still come over? She apologized. Being a night owl, I thought, why not? Let's give it a shot, even though it was already 10 p.m. As you can imagine, the 10 minutes she said she would take to get there turned into 20. I began to question whether I was wasting my time when another text message arrived. Just pulling up now, she messaged. My curiosity overcame me, even though she said she was just pulling up. A mixture of anticipation and caution filled me as I made my way to the front door. My heart skipped a beat as I approached the door. Not only was the woman there in my driveway, but her car also had four or five additional occupants. Who are they? I asked, feeling a knot in my stomach. They all want to see the entertainment center, the woman explained in a casual manner. I don't know about you, but having a bunch of strangers break into my house wasn't in the plan. I firmly informed her that only she could enter to check out the TV. I wasn't even sure I wanted her to enter my home at that point. I'm sorry, but I can't allow everyone in, I stated firmly. 
Despite her insistence, she might understand. So I told her no. I was surprised to see the woman lose her composure and become angry at my choice. This is ridiculous. You're not being very accommodating, she snapped. She had the goal to accuse me of not living up to my Christian obligations. Let me tell you, putting myself in danger wasn't part of being a good Christian. As you might imagine, I locked all the doors because I was uneasy and went inside my house for protection. With my heart racing, I couldn't help but glance out the window. One of the guys who was with her made the odd decision to relieve himself at the end of my driveway, which made things even more bizarre. It looked like a scene from a horror film throughout. They eventually got back in the car, and with a screech of tires, they all drove off into the night. I couldn't believe it. It was like a nightmare had abruptly ended when I considered what might have occurred if I had allowed them inside. I couldn't help but shudder. I learned a valuable lesson about using Craigslist to transact with strangers after that terrifying incident. I made sure to exercise extra caution and follow my gut instincts going forward. Simply put, you can never be sure who is lurking in the online world shadows on the other side of that screen. Therefore, keep my story in mind. If you ever find yourself selling something on Craigslist, be wary, establish boundaries, and resist pressure to jeopardize your safety. After all, it's preferable to be branded a bad Christian than to experience a real-life horror story. I was born and raised in a small town, a place where everyone knew everyone else, and life was simple and predictable. However, life had other plans for me, and I found myself moving to the big city, a place teeming with life, noise, and endless possibilities. The transition was not easy, and I had to make several adjustments to fit into my new environment. One of these adjustments involved selling my car, a reliable six-year-old Honda, a cord that had been my faithful companion through many adventures. The decision to sell my car was not an easy one. It was more than just a vehicle. It was a symbol of my past life, a life that was quickly fading into the background as I embraced the hustle and bustle of city life. However, I realized that owning a car in the city was more of a burden than a convenience. With public transportation readily available, and parking space is hard to come by, I decided to let go of my beloved car. I posted an ad on Craigslist hoping to find a buyer who would appreciate my car as much as I did. Soon, I was contacted by a man named Mark. Hello, I'm Mark. I saw your ad about the car. Is it still available, he asked over the phone. He was in his early 40s and seemed like a decent person. He told me that he was interested in buying the car for his daughter, who was about to start college. We had a few phone conversations, and everything seemed to be going well. When Mark came for the test drive, he was friendly and showed genuine interest in the car. He inspected every nook and cranny, asked questions, and seemed satisfied with the car's condition. We negotiated the price, and after some back and forth, we agreed on a fair amount. Mark asked me to hold the car for him for two days while he arranged for the payment, and I agreed. Two days later, we met again in a familiar neighborhood. Mark was as friendly as before, and everything seemed to be going according to plan. We took the car for one last test drive, and then it was time for the payment. Mark handed me a cashier's check from Chase Bank. I suggest we go to the bank together to cash the check and transfer the title I suggested. But Mark's demeanor suddenly changed. He became hesitant and seemed nervous. We were parked by the side of the street, discussing the bank visit when Mark asked to inspect the car one more time. I agreed, and as we both stepped out of the car, Mark suddenly jumped back into the driver's seat and sped off, leaving me standing on the sidewalk shocked and confused. Panic surged through me as I watched my car disappear down the street. 
I turned to the bystanders pleading for someone to call 911. A kind stranger dialed the emergency number, and I quickly explained the situation to the dispatcher. As I was talking, a police car pulled up nearby, and I flagged them down. I got into the back of the police car, and gave them all the information I could remember about my car and the man who had stolen it. The officers reassured me that they would do everything they could to find my car, but unfortunately, the thief managed to get away. In the following weeks, I had to deal with the aftermath of the theft. I filed a police report, contacted my insurance company, and tried to come to terms with the loss of my car. I was frustrated and angry with myself for letting my guard down and allowing this to happen. Three months later, just as I was about to receive compensation from my insurance company, I received a call from the police. They had found my car three states away. It turned out that Mark had been part of a car theft ring. He had stolen my car and sold it to another man who had then sold it to an unsuspecting buyer. The police arranged for all of us to meet at the station. The man who had bought my car from the thief agreed to return the car to me, and the thief agreed to refund the money to the buyer. In the end, I did receive compensation for my car, but the whole ordeal left me feeling stressed and demoralized. Despite this experience, I continued to buy and sell cars on Craigslist. However, I learned a valuable lesson from this incident. Now, I always make sure to take a photo of the buyer's driver's license at the beginning of every meeting. This experience taught me the importance of being cautious and vigilant, especially when dealing with strangers. This happened quite a while back when I was 18 years old. I lived with my folks, even though I had recently moved on from secondary school. I just purchased another PC. Furthermore, after I was finished getting it set up, I posted my old one on Craigslist. It was just two years old. Yet in those days, that implied it was obsolete. It was a Dell PC with fair specs, and it was very nearly 2,000 bucks fresh out of the box. I was asking for just 500 because more current workstations at the time were significantly better. After posting it on the web, I didn't need to wait long for a reaction. A person named Toby informed me I was inspired by the PC, but I needed to see it first. I needed to set up a chance to meet next week when I would be in Midtown. That way we could meet at a bistro or something like that. At the point when I proposed it, Toby said that he wanted it immediately. Therefore I consented to allow him to approach my home. I realized gathering in a public place would be more brilliant. Be that as it may, our home was in suburbia, and I didn't have a vehicle. I realized it was apathetic and moronic. Yet I gave him my residence. My folks weren't home, and I figured it'd be a speedy deal and that nothing would turn out badly. Toby appeared sometime thereafter, on a Saturday at around 7 p.m. I saw a more seasoned van maneuver into the carport, and a man got out. In any case, he was in good company. He had one more person with him. The two of them were no less than 30, a lot greater than me. When that's what I saw, I felt somewhat frightened. Something about their presence felt off. In any case, I forgot about the inclination. All things considered, they were only there to check a PC out. I let them in and we set up in the kitchen. I started showing the PC to Toby and afterward his companion promptly requested that I utilize the restroom. I pointed him to the correct heading, which was not far off and down a short passage. Then at that point I zeroed in on showing the PC to Toby. Around 10 minutes passed while we were checking it out. I had deleted it in advance, so it was fundamentally running as new. Then at that point I unexpectedly understood that the other man hadn't gotten back from the washroom. Hello, he's your companion. Good, I asked Toby. No doubt, you can take some time some of the time, just relax. He consoled me. I tuned in as intently as I could and heard strides that weren't coming from the washroom region. They were coming from higher up. Since there were only the three of us in the house, I realized it was him. The restroom was on the fundamental floor, so there was not a great explanation for him to be up there. That was the point at which I began to overreact inside, however, I attempted to conceal it. I nonchalantly got some information about his companion once more, trusting my anxiety wasn't appearing. His reaction was cold and frightening. He put his hand on my shoulder, not in a well-disposed way, but rather with a ton of strain. He told me not to stress over it. His grasp was fixed agonizingly. Furthermore, 
At that time, I realized this was something other than a deal that turned out badly. We were being ransacked. That was most likely the arrangement all along. Alarm set in that I attempted to keep my poise. I advised Toby to take anything they desired and simply go however. He didn't give up. His grasp on my shoulder felt hard. It resembled danger. What's more, I began to shake. I realized I needed to move quickly. I figured out how to split away and arbitrarily my father's office on the primary floor, locking the entryway behind me. I left my telephone on the kitchen table, which was a dumb slip-up. Fortunately, however, there was a landline in the workplace where I was, so that saved me. My heart was beating as I dialed 911, making sense of the circumstances for the dispatcher. The man is trusting that the police will show up on the longest day of his life. I could hear the two men stepping around the house, most likely taking anything they might find. They probably realized the police were on their way since they took off in no time and cleaned out the front window as they returned to the van on the carport and dashed away. At the point when I was certain they were gone, I emerged to see what was taken. The main things I saw missing on the fundamental floor were the little television in the kitchen and the PC that I was selling. Notwithstanding, I later figured out that a large portion of my mother's gems were taken, as well as no less than $200 in real money. The police appeared around 10 minutes after the burglars left. They remained for some time. However, at that point, they left without making any commitments. He was unacceptable. That was the last I heard from the police about what occurred. I contacted them a few times, yet they never hit me up. At the point when my folks and sister returned home, I needed to make sense of what occurred. They generally thought I was kidding from the outset since I have a dull, funny bone. Yet, when they figured out it was genuine, they were distraught as well. I would gauge the misfortunes at around $3,000, which was a tremendous amount of cash for me at that point. Since it was all my issue, I needed to take care of it. That was essentially my entire summer of work down the channel. It was the last time I met an unusual individual off the web. If I was ever to rehash it, there'd be no chance I would allow them to come to my place. It's a public or private arrangement with no exemptions. I use various websites like Craigslist for the same reasons everyone else does. You can find expensive items at significantly discounted prices, or even just cheap things for even cheaper. I don't have a ton of money and using these sites is sometimes essential when it comes to getting things like furniture that's usually really expensive to buy anywhere else. This happened when I was looking around for a dining room table. Ours was really old, and my whole family used it as a place to eat and as a workspace, so it's been through a lot over the years. I went around on Facebook Marketplace and OfferUp, but neither had anything good. Most of them were still expensive, and even when I tried to bargain with a few of the sellers, none of them would budge. So then I went to Craigslist. Around here I think most people use other sites nowadays, but Craigslist still always had the cheapest deals, though they were still somewhat rare to find. But almost as soon as I opened up the site and hit enter on the search bar, a really good listing showed up. It was a very basic wooden dining table that didn't have much wear on it, and the seller posted it for only $100. Compared to the $400, $500 everyone else was listing things for, this was a steal. I sent a message saying I'd love to check it out and would be willing to pay the full price. He didn't reply immediately, so I just took a break and hung out with my kids until around 7 when they went to their rooms to get ready for bed. I went back to my laptop and found a response from just a couple minutes ago. It was a very quick few sentences, saying he was sorry but the table was going to be thrown out tomorrow morning, but if I really wanted it, I'd have to come by tonight or any time before 5 a.m. tomorrow. It was weird that he'd be willing to sell it at any time during the night, and his reasoning didn't make all that much sense to me, but after some thought, I replied back saying I could pick it up right now. I didn't want to go there really late into the night, or super early in the morning, but it was only 7, so I didn't see a problem if I was able to go right now. The man replied quickly, agreeing and sending the address. It was only 10 minutes from my place. So I let my wife know what was going on and where I'd be, then headed out. From context clues, you probably already know that I don't live in a lavish area. So when I say the seller's house was really worn down, I mean it was really worn down. It was small like the others in our area, but the yard was full of trash and random other things, was surrounded by a thin chain link fence. I parked on the side and opened the fence walking through the yard and up to the door, which was already open. I could hear some people talking and laughing. I peeked inside and gave a light knock on the door. Right away, a man came around the corner and invited me in. 
He looked like he was in late college, somewhere in his mid-twenties. As I stepped inside though, I couldn't help but notice how disgusting the whole place was. There were beer cans laying around and stains in the carpet. It looked like a really poorly taken care of house where they had probably hosted hundreds of college parties. The man was very laid back though, casually walking me down the hallway and into the kitchen while talking about how he didn't have room for the table anymore. When we got to the kitchen, there were two other men, looking about the same age and standing against the wall, seemingly in the middle of a conversation. Next to them was the table, somehow it looked almost untouched. I didn't know how that was possible considering the rest of the house. I walked around it and checked to see if it was stable and whatnot, but as I did, the house suddenly went quiet. The two talking had stopped and the man selling the table didn't speak either. I looked up, seeing them all staring at me. Did I do something I asked, looking around at each of them? When my eyes fell on one of the men closest to me though, I noticed that his pupils were massive, something that only being drugged up could achieve, but what he was on I didn't know. Regardless, in that moment, I knew this wasn't right. Not only was this getting strange, but I didn't want to buy a table that's been in this kind of house and used by these sorts of people. Um, I think I'm gonna pass on it. Thank you though, I said softly. I started walking toward the hallway, but one of them stepped in front of me. He didn't say anything, he just stood there, blocking the way out. Something about the way they were all looking and acting. I could tell that whatever this was, was planned out, and they likely never meant to sell the table. My face fell to fear, as the anticipation of just standing there, surrounded by these strangers, began to overwhelm me. But then one of them stepped over and whispered something in the other's ear, and they moved aside, still not saying anything. I cautiously walked between them, hurrying down the hallway and out the door. A lot of things went through my head on the drive home. I knew that they were planning something horrible, but what that was and why they ended up letting me go, I'm not so sure of. When I got home, I told my wife, who convinced me to call the police and report it, but they couldn't do anything without anything having happened. So whatever those men were planning, I'll probably never know. I just hope someone else doesn't have to find out. I wanted to move out of my old apartment in a few months and was hoping to get some money to help pay for movers. The shoes were nothing special, but I listed them for generous prices, hoping to get them bought quickly. It was some guy whose email had the name John K in it and he offered just $5 less than my listing price. It seemed like an unnecessary adjustment to the original price, but I didn't want to keep waiting for more offers, so I wrote him back saying I was okay with that. We set up to meet the following day at five in the parking lot of a public gas station in the middle of town. The next day I sent a text and he confirmed that he was on his way, so I left as well and got to the gas station right at five. They weren't there yet, but there was a lot of traffic on the road, so I figured he'd be late. I sat in my car patiently, and over the course of 30 minutes, the roads cleared up and the sun started coming down, and then John finally pulled in. He drove a small sedan with none of the headlights working and resembling something from a scrapyard. He parked next to me and got out. John looked like he was in his 30s and was a pretty large guy, wearing ripped up clothes and having long, unkempt hair. He didn't say much, so I brought out the shoes and let him look at them. As he held them though and didn't say anything, he kept looking back at the gas station. I don't know what he was looking at, I thought, but after he checked over his shoulder multiple times, I glanced over as well. The gas station was empty aside from one guy putting gas in his car, but otherwise I didn't know what he could be looking at. John was taking his time though, pointlessly looking over everything multiple times, as if they were some really rare shoes that he was going to drop hundreds on, but these were just some regular sneakers, nothing fancy or rare. Then John looked over his shoulder one more time, just as the car by the pump started to drive away, and all of a sudden, his whole demeanor changed. He stopped looking at the shoes and looked at me. What else do you have, he asked abruptly. I looked at him confused. Those are the only shoes I brought. I didn't know you were interested in others. His eyes went cold as he stepped past me and put his hand on my car door, trying to open it. It was locked, I explained. John immediately looked at me and told me to unlock it. His voice was deep and strict, like it was a threat if I didn't. I kind of just stared at him and tried to wrap my head around this, thinking of what the best course of action would be, but in the moment, there's just no time to really think through options. I unlocked the door, knowing at most all he could take was a couple random bills I had in the front, but then he said something that I was not expecting at all. Get in, he opened the passenger door and told me again. I stood there, 
even more taken aback, but now starting to get way more worried about where this was going. I looked behind me, hoping someone else was here, but the gas station was empty. No people or cars anywhere in sight. John grabbed my arm and pulled me over to the door, taking the keys from me and aggressively shoving me into the car while throwing a few punches landing on the right side of my face. I immediately tried to get up, but John slammed the door against my head, making my vision go blurry and everything just sort of fading in and out. I heard him start walking around the car as if he was going to the driver's side, but then he suddenly turned around and sprinted back to his truck. I was still out of it and barely remember anything else, but I guess someone pulled in at the perfect time and confronted John, scaring him away. If they hadn't have helped me and John was able to get in and presumably drive away, I don't know what would have happened. Assuming his car was either stolen or untraceable to his name, then stealing my car and abducting me would have left no trace of our interaction, giving him days, if not weeks, to do whatever it was he planned before anyone would even come looking. I used to frequently purchase iPhones, video game systems, TVs, and many other items on Facebook Marketplace, then resell them on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace to make a profit. I've been doing this for years as a side job, and I've learned a lot along the way. Hello, I'm Mark. I saw your ad about the car. Is it still available? I usually try to resell iPhones because they seem to have the highest profit margin. On one occasion, I got an iPhone 10 for $155. This was over a year ago, so it was a very good deal. You'd be surprised how low the prices you can negotiate from these people if you try. Most people might reject such ridiculous offers, but many just want quick cash, and they'll sell it to the first person who contacts them. So I took full advantage of it. Anyway, I had listed that iPhone 10 for sale at $300, and I wrote in the description that I would consider best offers. Usually this phone sells quickly, so I wasn't too worried about rejecting offers less than $300 because most of the time I could sell it within a week at the original price if I just waited. Just an hour after I posted the listing, someone contacted me who was interested in the phone. Hi, I'm interested in the iPhone. Can we meet tomorrow? They asked a few questions and planned to meet the next day in the late afternoon after they got off work. A few hours before the meeting, they messaged me and asked if I could come directly to their house instead of meeting at Walmart like we had planned before. I was immediately wary of that request, but I still asked them for their address so I could put it into the GPS app on my phone to see how far it was. They were only about 20 minutes away which wasn't too far actually, and they were willing to pay the full $300 for the phone. So I decided to go for it. I told them I could deliver the phone to their house, and that was fine. I just told them to let me know what time I should come. They thanked me excessively and kept telling me how I was a lifesaver and how grateful they were to me for helping them. They then asked if I could come at 7.30 p.m., and they would definitely be home by then. I agreed, but I didn't like that they wanted to meet so late. I had to get up for work the next morning at 5 a.m., and I like to have some alone time at home and get some time to myself before I have to sleep. When they initially said we could meet after they got off work, they said late afternoon. So I expected it to be between 4.30 to 6 p.m., maybe at the latest, but I still went along with it because I really wanted to sell the phone. This woman didn't live in a neighborhood. She lived on a street off the main road in town. She definitely had neighbors, but the area had a somewhat rural feel to it. Around 7.20 p.m., I left because I wanted to make sure she would be there when I arrived. I told her when I was on my way and that I would arrive in about 20 minutes. When I arrived and knocked on the door, my anxiety tripled, waiting for an answer. It was starting to get dark, so that didn't help much. When the woman opened the door, she introduced herself as Sabrina. She invited me in and introduced me to her husband, who was sitting on the couch in the living room. Almost immediately, they started mocking me, 
making fun of my clothes and appearance, and even tried to pass it off as a joke. But I sensed strong passive aggression almost immediately after I walked in. I had a strange feeling about these people. There was something very wrong about them. I thought Sabrina might be on drugs because she was acting weird. And she looked like someone who was using something. And I'm not talking about weed. I'm talking about serious hard drugs. Her eyes looked sunken, and she was pale as a corpse. She was definitely on something. Trust me. She just wasn't acting right. Not like a normal person. Anyway, she was rude and somewhat pushy while I was there and argued with her husband about how much she was willing to pay for the phone. I let them look at the phone. Sabrina wanted to put her SIM card into the phone before buying it because she wanted to make sure the phone would work. She then started complaining about a small crack on the phone. Even though I stated in the description that there was a small crack and it was fully visible in the photos I took. She started getting upset and said that I was trying to scam her. She said she wouldn't pay more than $200 for it. I immediately said no and asked for the phone back, constantly trying to negotiate, and I said that I wouldn't accept less than $250. I made it very clear that I wouldn't accept anything less than that. Not liking that at all, she took her SIM card back from the phone and literally threw it towards me. And I mean she really threw it at me like really hard. The phone hit me directly in the face and then fell to the floor after bouncing from my head to the hardwood floor. What's wrong with you I asked. Then she ran off somewhere, I think it was her bedroom. I started screaming and crying hysterically. Her husband tried to calm me down and gave me $100 so I wouldn't call the police. I accepted the $100 and I didn't call. One day, I was browsing Craigslist out of sheer boredom. I wasn't looking for anything specific, and at that time I didn't even know that people used Craigslist for dating or meeting new people, and making friends or anything like that. But after doing some research, I found out that it definitely exists. I was very bored and quite lonely, so I started looking through the listings. There was a guy named Tom, who was very handsome. He said he was 32 years old. I myself was 34 years old at the time, so we were around the same age. I wasn't looking for anything specific, I'm a very laid back person, so I usually just go with the flow of whatever happens. He had a good aura and seemed like a genuine person. And he also wasn't too pushy, so I wasn't too worried about the scam situation. He was clearly attractive though, and I liked everything about his profile, so I gave him a chance. Hi, I'm Tom. Nice to meet you. We started talking, and eventually, he got my phone number. We talked for a few days through text messages, and calls this also turned out to be positive, because he lived less than 10 minutes from where I lived. He asked if I wanted to go out that weekend to the nearest bar on Saturday. I said yes, and we continued to talk. Everything progressed quickly, and we very quickly moved from friendly conversation to very flirtatious conversation. On our first date at the bar, when we met on Saturday, everything went well. We talked casually, got a bit drunk, had good food, and I had a lot of fun. I definitely liked this guy, and I had feelings for him. Then, towards the end of the night, just before we were about to part ways, I got a message from a random number saying, and I quote, Stay away from my man, you better not be there with him when I get there. I was very confused. I showed him the message I received, he dismissed it as if it were irrelevant, and he didn't know what or who it was. Then he became very awkward and started acting suspicious, like he wanted to leave right away. Just before we were about to part ways, his girlfriend showed up. Yes, I said his girlfriend. He had a girlfriend this whole time. I was quite angry, and I had been drinking, so I didn't hold back from this woman at all. She started screaming at him and calling me various names and saying rude things to me. I started shouting back at her, and I guess she didn't like it because she actually took off her shoe and threw it in my direction. 
Then she started attacking me with her bag and hitting me, pulling my hair, and beating me up badly. What are you doing with my man, you home wrecker? I tried to defend myself by grabbing her hair, but before I could, I fell to the ground and hit my head on the concrete. I had to go to the hospital because I was almost unconscious. That night was a big mistake. I still can't believe I was ever in that situation in the first place. I'm a very calm, friendly and polite person, so the whole thing was very out of character for me, if you will. I didn't even know how she found out about us, or even how she knew we were at the bar together. I'm glad she found out before I got too involved with this guy, and got more heartache than I already got. She eventually got arrested that night and charged with assault. I walked away without any charges or time in jail at all. I just went away with a severe concussion, and a big reminder of why I'll never meet random strangers from the internet again. I now have a fiancé. We've been together for over five years, and we're getting married next year. We plan to start a family soon, and I've never been happier. This is just one of the stories I like to tell when warning people about the dangers of the internet and meeting unknown strangers. You never know what someone's true intentions could be. Things could have been much worse for me that night.